in this talk, I want to kind of go through uh, sort of a broad overview detailing um, the concepts that underlie, you know, how nested sampling works, why we're interested in sort of doing it, how to implement it in practice, and then finally, uh, sort of looking at some extensions, in particular, uh, dynamic nested sampling methods uh, that try and get around some of the, the drawbacks that they have. So the, the background for this comes from fundamentally Bayes' theorem, uh, which I'm sure has come up uh, a billion times and uh, will continue to do so throughout the course of the workshop. Um, you know, the idea that uh, the posterior that we're looking at here for some parameters theta given our data, and in particular condition on a, a given model, uh, you know, a set of assumptions that we've made is just going to be the product of the likelihood, the data given the, the parameters of the model, the prior uh, for the given model, and then also the evidence. Um, normally, right, like uh, this is the idea and fundamental, uh, you know, challenge of Bayesian inference is figuring out how to characterize this posterior distribution. So one way to think about nested sampling is to think about how we want to generate an approximation uh, you know, of the posterior that we can use to do a bunch of uh, you know, interesting inference, in particular computing things like expectation values, predictive distributions, and things like that. Um, and so how do we generate sort of uh, samples from that distribution in such a way to to further these goals. One way to think about that is to sort of imagine that we have, you know, some distribution kind of, you know, shown here. We have some prior that's indicated by this box. And then we have some likelihood that sort of is shown here in these different little contour levels. Um, and one thing that's, that's always abundantly clear um, for anyone who's worked with this in practice is that sampling directly from the likelihood is, is really hard. Um, you know, this is one of the reasons why, you know, MCMC methods, uh, you know, there is so much work that's devoted to actually making them really robust and efficient um, is because what MCMC tries to do, these Markov chain Monte Carlo approaches, is really what I like to think of solving a hard problem once. So you want to figure out how do I actually tackle this thing and generate samples directly from the distribution. Nested sampling tries to take a different approach here, which is, is there some way that we can take this very hard problem and turn it into something that's a little easier? So in other words, rather than having, say, a point that we're trying to generate a bunch of samples for and constructing these chains, can we do something different? Um, and one of the conceptual ideas is trying to break this hard problem into a lot of easier problems that we then have to solve repeatedly many times. And that is trying to sample uniformly within the bounds uh, some, of some hard likelihood bound. In other words, just sampling all the points or any point subject to some constraint that it's likely it has to be larger than some threshold. And this, in theory, is easier conceptually. Um, and the idea behind nested sampling is that over time, you, as you sample points and you use those points to define some unknown contour of, of sort of possible regions of likelihood, you then want to just generate a sample you know, somewhere inside that region. And then you want to rinse and repeat by generating a new region based on that new sample and then shrinking again. So the idea is that rather than sort of just generating one single chain that you're then sort of sampling over the entire distribution, uh, you're instead trying to slice up the distribution into many of these discrete levels or plateaus or chunks. Um, and then within each one, you're solving an easier problem, which is not trying to sample from the whole you know, complicated likelihood distribution, but just from somewhere inside this, this unknown region. So one thing you might notice is that you know, there's this constraint that we have to sample uniformly within this region. And sort of in this simple example, right, uniformly just means within this box. But in practice, as long as you have some function, uh, you know, usually the inverse CDF or anything else, some type of transform function that converts your prior to a uniform distribution, then this particular toy problem that I've illustrated here for, for conceptual you know, understanding is essentially equivalent to any real uh, problem and set of priors that you might use. So as long as you have some sort of function that, that does this transformation, uh, then this very simple case is equivalent to the general case. Another motivation for thinking about nested sampling is rather than sort of from the sampling perspective is from the integrating perspective. Um, in other words, if we go back to our, our original uh, you know, expression here, this term here for the evidence, um, which I'm just going to rewrite kind of in this, in this simpler way, uh, 
this, this term here on the bottom for the evidence is really this integral over the product of the likelihood and the prior over all of parameter space. And this term uh, really is very useful for doing model comparison, right? Because in practice, it's telling you the probability of your data condition on your model marginalized over all parameters. Or sort of conceptually speaking, you're doing sort of a prior weighted average of your likelihood, um, which makes very intuitive sense. So if you wanna compare one model to another, one way to do that is to essentially compute what's the average likelihood over the entire set of models that I think are possible given my prior. Um, and then you compare that to a different set of models, which has a different set of priors and different set of assumptions. And you can sort of see on balance, which one has larger likelihoods than the other, uh, and therefore which one is nominally more likely. This brings up the question about how do we compute sort of this uh, normalizing constant, this evidence in order to actually do this integral. Um, and I'll start with the simpler one, which is, you know, imagine we just want to integrate the posterior directly, right? So the product of the uh, prior and the likelihood, how exactly would we do this um, in theory? So one way to think about how to evaluate an integral um, is to break it up into, into portions. And in physics, of course, the uh, classic approach is to break it up into spherical shells. So the idea is that rather than thinking about integrating over all of the parameters individually, you know, X, Y, and Z, what we can instead do is we can define sort of these, uh, you know, ISO likelihood contours, which are sort of at some fixed level, lambda. And each of these levels then corresponds to one of the sort of rings in some high dimensional surface. Um, we don't quite know what this is, but conceptually speaking, this is straightforward. So each of these is gonna be associated with some given probability, which is like indicated here. And it's gonna have some associated volume element with that shell. So we're just taking a, you know, for example, a Euclidean coordinate system in X, Y, Z, and we're just gonna turn it into uh, a coordinate system that is more amenable to us, which is in, in sort of uh, spherical shell space. So that's just one way of writing this out. So we can reparameterize this problem and say, what we really want to do is just from you know, the uh, zero level, which includes everything to sort of the, the maximum at infinity, which includes nothing. Um, we just wanna kind of integrate in these little shells uh, until we, we uh, go through the whole distribution. So this has two interesting terms that come up here. Um, I think often uh, get overlooked when doing a lot of inference, which is that you see this, this explicit amplitude term, or in other words, and there's this volume term. In particular, right, this amplitude term, um, the, essentially the probability for a given sort of volume element uh, is really a density. And so when you're multiplying it by a volume, you can think of it as giving you a mass. Uh, or what's often referred to in sort of uh, more statistics concepts is thinking about this as being the typical set. In other words, you have the likelihood of something happening, but also just the frequency of it happening, right? Um, you have a bunch of parameters. There's only one best fit, but there are many mediocre fits. And so on average, you might find that the mediocre fits kind of went out in the end over, over your single best fit prediction. So this mass is something that we're interested in estimating since that's where the bulk of this integral is going to be concentrated. So to phrase this another way, if we imagine that we have some sort of spherical distribution and we're just looking at distance from the, the best fit or the, the uh, map estimate, which is up here, the posterior is gonna kind of decline uh, you know, in some exponential fashion, but the volume is gonna increase you know, according to the number of parameters in, uh, in your model. In other words, the geometry of the, of the parameter space. And this increase is gonna be proportional to the number of dimensions minus one. And so the product of those two is gonna give you this purple curve. And this ultimately is where most of the contributions to this integral come from, as where we need to focus our attention when trying to compute things like the, the evidence to do model selection or model comparison. So that's the idea. Um, is that we want to figure out where this typical set or this posterior mass is located. And nested sampling is gonna give us a way to do that directly. So if we just rewrite this back in, in terms of the more general expression, um, what nested sampling tries to do is to actually this really easy solution to sampling that I described earlier, which is taking this complicated problem and chopping it up into a bunch of simpler problems is really just another way of reformulating this integral in exactly the way I've described. 
In other words, we're going to take our distribution, we're going to chop it up into these different contours. Each of these contours is going to be associated with some particular uh, you know, volume element. These get multiplied together. And so if we go from sort of this distribution here shown on the left to this one dimensional integral as a function of volume, which is here indicated by x, sort of shown here on the right, you get kind of this particular function. And estimating the area under this curve then gives you this uh, marginal distribution. So we have this really nice convergence of two different approaches. The idea first of trying to solve this problem, uh, turn one complicated problem into an easier problem, but also doing so in such a way that we can actually evaluate, for example, these uh, integral estimates in order to do model comparisons. This is obviously very important when you want to compare, say, different template types uh, or you know, different ways of parameterizing localization of sources. So what you can then do is under some uh, usually very justified regularity conditions, you can invert this whole relationship. So we can define, rather than sort of the likelihood, we can define some you know, volume as a function of these different levels. And then we can flip it around and say, let's define the likelihood as a function of these volumes. And we're just going to integrate over these volume elements. This integral is going to go from 0 to 1 uh, because these volume elements are normalized to be relative to the prior. So when you encompass the entire prior or this entire box, uh, that's going to be 100%. Uh, and then uh, when you sort of approach the maximum possible likelihood value, you're going to be at 0. So this is kind of this really neat trick that nested sampling uses where you turn this really complicated multidimensional integral that's shown here um, into something that is very straightforward and one dimensional, which is this final solution here. And in fact, one dimensional over a, you know, a finite range bounded from zero to one. We can then approximate this integral since it's now in one dimension, right? We can kind of look at this curve on the bottom here and say, well, we can just approximate this using any standard uh, numerical integration techniques. So let's just assume that we can do, say, a Riemann approximation. Um, with the Riemann sum. And that's just going to be, we're going to sample a bunch of random points. We're going to assign them some small rectangles and then boom, uh, we're good. The problem of course, is that in practice, right? We don't really know what this term here is, this volume, because we're kind of just picking points at random. And, you know, we don't quite know what the shape of these contours actually is when we're, we're actually sampling. But, Nested sampling, if you do it in a very particular way, the way that the, uh, the method is constructed actually gives you an estimator of the volume at every iteration. So this means you have a bit of a noisy estimate, but it's a good one. And so that means that overall, nested sampling really enables you to do is sample in such a way that you turn this hard problem into many easier problems by sampling from these you know, flat uh, ISO likelihood contours. When you do this in a particular way, it tells you sort of roughly speaking what, uh, what volume you're kind of located at, which tells you, you know, what level you're kind of based at. You can then turn that into this estimate for the, the volume, which gives you a weight. And ultimately that is super great because it means that you actually get estimates of the posterior for free as part of actually doing this, this whole sampling procedure. And one thing that's also really neat and is also why I use this purple color, um, is that you can see kind of directly that the things that go into this weight, which is the likelihood times the volume, is actually directly proportional to this typical set or this posterior mass. So by estimating this integral, we're actually, nested sampling is actually doing this in this very, very natural way, where as we sample sort of points from uh, all over, from left to right here, what we're doing is we're assigning them weights proportional to this purple curve. Um, rather than say an MCMC where it's going to be some, you know, hybrid of essentially frequency based on this blue curve and then this red curve. And that's the sampling we're directly sort of estimating uh, the typical set or the posterior mass rather than estimating it sort of indirectly through other means. So that's at least the conceptual idea behind what nested sampling is trying to do and how it works. Um, and now I'm going to sort of start turning to some more practical applications of how this actually gets implemented and ultimately what's used in a lot of codes today uh, in the literature. The first is figure out when to stop. Um, and nets and sampling is nice in that there are really well-defined stopping criteria. Um, one way you can think about this is actually just writing out, for example, if we're looking at the evidence here, 
we want, we want to break this into two components. One is the estimate that we currently have at some iteration i. And then the rest of it's going to be some remainder term in our integral, because we know that we've only gone to some particular point and we have some remaining probability left. So what exactly is that probability going to be? So we can think about specifying uh, a stopping criterion based on essentially the amplitude of this remainder. In other words, we want to make sure that the amount that we've estimated so far is going to be some fraction of the uh, true sort of expected uh, you know, value of this integral or evidence. So we could just find sort of a way to upper bound this remainder term, uh, in other words, this z in, then we can figure out a way to do sampling really effectively. So we can do some substitutions. So first we know that the, uh, you know, this term here on the left is just gonna be based on this approximation that we've constructed. So this is coming directly from nested sampling. And so then we need to figure out a way to bound the, the term on the right. And one of the ways that we do that, or the easiest, is by substituting in essentially L max times uh, Xn. And what this is in practice is essentially saying that let's consider a worst case scenario where we're sampling and then we're sampling and we're sampling. And then finally we get to the center and suddenly the distribution becomes this uniform slab of maximum probability. There's no way that you can get worse than that. Um, and that slab is going to have an amplitude of the maximum likelihood. Um, and then the volume is gonna be associated with the remaining volume interior to where you've sampled so far. So this is a, a hard upper bound. In practice, of course, we don't know quite what the maximum likelihood of the distribution is because we only have estimates of it. Um, we also don't quite know what the volume is because we're estimating that too as part of our nested sampling process, but we can approximate it. Um, and so that gives us this sort of softer uh, upper bound where if we replace all of these uh, you know, actual theoretical quantities with their estimated ones that come from the sampling procedure itself, uh, we probably have a pretty good upper limit that we can use to determine when we want to, to stop sampling. So this is nice in the sense that nested sampling gives you this very well-defined stopping criterion based on this remainder uh, for this integral. The other challenges are how you actually do the sampling in practice. So far, I've kind of just assumed that we can sample from within random contours that we don't know. Um, and that's not quite true in practice. Um, there's a bunch of details associated with how exactly we can generate those samples. One way to think about this is, uh, you know, imagine we have some distribution, we generate a sequence of samples, starting from this one down here, uh, and then proceeding sort of through these particular points. Each of these are associated with some uh, unknown sort of uh, likelihood contours, which are all shown here. Um, and we want to figure out how to do sampling from this. A really naive approach is we have a prior. Why don't we kind of just sample from that? That seems straightforward. You know, nested sampling says that we want to sample uniformly, you know, within some distribution or prior is uniform. We can just start with that. The problem is we can imagine that, for example, we generate a bunch of samples, uh, say, at the second iteration, and we finally accept kind of this one that's here in red. And you see that we have, you know, some samples that are outside the distribution and some that are outside sort of this particular difference between the level defined by one, and the level defined by two, but it's okay. The problem occurs as you start shrinking, as you go further and further, the amount of rejected samples that you're going to get is going to just keep ballooning. And in fact, it'll increase exponentially. Um, and this is just because as you sort of shrink further and further, there's smaller and smaller uh, areas of parameter space that are now acceptable above some given likelihood threshold. So just sampling from the prior is not a good long-term solution. So we need something better that we can use than sort of naive sampling like this. Um, and this is where a lot of the practical implementations and challenges of nested sampling comes in. So the main idea is that we need some way of sampling from what's called the constrained prior. Um, or at least conditioned on what we think the prior looks like. And so one of the first proposals for implementing nested sampling in practice, uh, which was developed by uh, Farhan Faraz, um, was to essentially try and construct some bound, which is based on, say, a set of overlapping uh, ellipsoids. So what we do is that every iteration, we have a bunch of samples that have been generated at, uh, that we're going to use. Then we can try and bound all those samples with, uh, you know, with some sort of ellipsoid. Then over time, as the samples kind of shrink and move further and further in, we're going to allow our ellipsoid to kind of shrink with them. 
And hopefully once they split into different distributions, we can kind of allow some clustering algorithm to follow our samples to, to different locations. So this is nice in theory. Um, in practice, uh, this is kind of what this procedure looks like. So there are various bounding strategies that people use to try and characterize, for example, the, the distributions that we're trying to sample from. Um, the one shown here on the left is an example of this uh, sort of naive sampling where there's no bound, you're sampled directly from uh, the prior. So that's sort of shown here in the schematic on the bottom. Uh, each of the purple points here is showing the actual set of samples that we have um, at a particular iteration. In nested sampling, these are often called live points, but if you're more comfortable thinking about them as chains, that's totally fine too. Um, and then the gray sort of shows random sampling based on this constrained prior. So there are different strategies that people have taken. Uh, you can see here that sampling from a single ellipsoid is better than sampling from none. Uh, if you use some clustering algorithm, you can actually split this into multiple ellipsoids and you can see that this isn't a terrible approximation either. Um, and more recent you know, proposals for sampling strategies, which involve things like overlapping balls or cubes from all these different live points and using that to estimate sort of the local density, uh, these all can work really well to characterize very complicated distributions um, in a really, really natural way. So this is one of the biggest benefits of, of nested sampling over uh, other approaches like MCMC is you have a lot of flexibility and how you can target these types of problems because fundamentally, you're not really interested in generating samples directly from the distribution. You just need to estimate some contours uh, you know, around sort of these flat distributions. And that just uh, allows you to, to approach this with a lot more uh, tools in your toolkit uh, to figure out how to do this. The second thing is once we have sort of these bounds, we then need to generate samples from those bounds, um, or I like to say condition on those bounds. Um, one of the standard approaches is doing uh, essentially uniform sampling, which is shown here in the top left. So in other words, we have some bound, which is shown here in, uh, in blue. Um, we have some, uh, and all we just need to do is we're just gonna sample randomly from within the blue bound, and then this is going to give us a sample that one day will kind of land in this, this region that we're interested in targeting. The problem, of course, is that there's no guarantees that any bound that we construct through some heuristic is going to contain all of the probability that we're interested in sampling. So a lot of more modern approaches have essentially tried to use these bounds more as things that we condition on and hopefully use to improve sampling, but not necessarily things that we require um, in order to. Uh, to actually do well. So one example of this are, are trying to generate random walk proposals, or in other words, running like MCMC inside uh, sort of an nested sampling algorithm. So in this case, the idea is that you can use your bound as sort of a way to generate proposals, and those proposals can allow you to move around. Um, and there can be different strategies for sort of pursuing these various things. Uh, alternate approaches that people have looked at have included slice sampling as well. Uh, which involves sort of using these bounds as ways to generate uh, random trajectories in the distributions and then sort of picking and slicing along these different trajectories. This can be very efficient since slice sampling doesn't require uh, sort of, or at least gets away from some of the random walk problems that come in from, uh, from typical approaches. And uh, more recently, people have looked into using gradient information uh, to try and do sampling based on sort of proposals and with momentum reflecting off of these different walls to, to generate ways to move forward. Um, but that uh, so far has at least shown uh, a little less promise than doing sort of standard uh, multivariate slice sampling. So again, these are all just various tools that people use to try and generate kind of these samples uniformly within these contours. Because in all these cases that I've shown here, you can sort of see the contours for yourself, but in practice, we actually have no idea where they are and we're just kind of exploring them uh, you know, during the sampling process. So this is kind of a brief overview of nested sampling and I wanna sort of pause here and talk a little bit about what are the advantages that it has and disadvantages, especially compared to more traditional approaches like for example, uh, MCMC algorithms. So there are a couple of main advantages to nested sampling. Uh, one of the main ones is this idea that it can actually characterize these really complicated uncertainties in real time. Um, and that just just another way of saying that you can deal with kind of, you know, widely separated modes uh, that maybe appear at different levels in the, you know, at, at different points in the modeling. Uh, or, you know, distributions that might have very weird and elongated shapes 
uh, it sometimes can be inaccessible or very difficult to sample from with sort of standard out of the box MCMC tools. But with using standard out of the box nested sampling tools, these distributions become much easier to target. Uh, in some cases, they can allocate samples much more efficiently. In other words, trying to solve a hard problem a single time can sometimes be very difficult. Um, and even though you're solving many more simple problems, uh, you sort of win out in the end because each problem is simple enough that you're very efficient in, in sampling from it. And so even though you have many different iterations of them, overall, on balance, you actually are sampling much more efficiently um, than MCMC. Uh, I also discussed that this sort of well-motivated stopping criteria, the fact that you kind of have a well-defined point for when you should stop sampling. Uh, and finally, the fact that nested sampling by its sort of construction and nature can be really helpful performing model selection which is starting to become uh, sort of one of the, the more interesting veins of applying Bayesian inference in practice, uh, especially when the exact model you pick is not necessarily very well defined. Uh, of course, there are a bunch of drawbacks as well. Um, one of the main ones in practice is that the implementations require a prior transform. You need some way to sort of map your complicated prior function uh, to sort of some uniform distribution in order for many uh, modern implementations to really work well. Um, without that, you kind of have uh, additional complexities that you have to deal with when, when sampling. Um, the runtime, of course, is gonna be sensitive to the size of the prior. Since we're computing integral that depends on exploring the entire range of the prior, this means that you have to think a lot more carefully about how big and, and how expansive your prior is going to be relative to the, the likelihood that you're actually sampling from. And this can be uh, you know, a significant drawback and that when you're running sort of standard MCMC approaches, uh, this isn't really as much of a concern. Once you sort of uh, converge to the distri target distribution in question, you just start sampling from it. It doesn't really matter. But nested sampling, because you're actually doing an integral from the outside of this distribution to the actual likelihood, um, the prior size does make a huge difference. So that can sometimes mean in practice that it can be difficult to apply nested sampling to cases where your priors are very broad relative to your, your likelihood. Um, and so that can, can require some additional uh, you know, thinking and work. Um, obviously every approach can miss certain solutions and nested sampling is no different. Uh, so certain types of solutions tend to be harder for nested sampling to hit than others. Um, and a lot of those depend on how many samples you're using and exactly how you construct things, but uh, nested sampling isn't perfect either. Um, you know, from practical perspective, it is more involved. You have to do a lot more setup for the problem. And there are sort of more, uh, you know, conceptual things to think about when, when applying nested sampling, um, even though the, uh, the actual implementation uh, often is not too difficult. And finally, one big one that I think Dan will actually talk about this afternoon um, in his talk sort of on scalable probabilistic inner inference is the, the use of gradients. Um, you know, a lot of the the development in, in MCMC has been through the use of gradients and especially Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, and nested sampling kind of by construction, by creating sort of these regions of sort of flat uh, distributions, all these different slices, um, can really use gradients as naturally as other approaches because there's no curvature, right? You're kind of flat on a surface until you hit an edge. Um, and that means that it has much more scaling properties uh, for our particular problems where gradients are accessible. In many cases in astronomy, that's not true. Um, you know, you're using kind of black box solvers or more complicated function calls that don't have easily computed gradients. And so in practice, this sometimes isn't as bad as it could be, but it definitely means that in terms of scalability to very, very complicated models, uh, nested sampling just has a lot of challenges. Um, and again, part of that's also because of the size of the prior issue. As your model gets more complicated, your prior is going to get larger and larger relative to the actual distribution in question. And so nested sampling will generally just take longer and longer to converge. One of the things I do wanna talk about though that actually has been solved is the, the fact that nested sampling now can function a lot more like MCMC. Um, and that in the past, one of the big drawbacks has been the fraction of quote unquote wasted samples doesn't adapt to the fact that the shape of, uh, of the posterior as you add more and more samples over time. Um, and this is sort of at the heart of dynamic nested sampling, which is uh, the last topic I want to close on. So one way to think about what nested sampling does is you're trying to compute this integral. And so this is now a, a way of rewriting lots of what I showed earlier. So the x-axis here is now sort of this log volume starting from zero, which is one over here, and then proceeding over to the left. So you can think of sampling going from left to right, as shown here in this plot. 
Um, this is sort of showing you the, the likelihood. And then you can see kind of because of the, you're taking the likelihood times the volume, you get sort of this particular bump. And this is this typical set for posterior mass where most of the distribution is concentrated. So what nested sampling is doing in general is you know, for a given chain uh, or a set of live points, uh, you're generating samples that are kind of equally spaced in, in volume. So starting from left to right, you're kind of laying down this grid where there's some you know, differences from point to point, but overall you're kind of uh, sampling this with some median resolution. And that means if you add in more points and you wanna say use multiple chains or multiple sets of live points, all you're just going to do is you're going to add more points both you know, in the region you care about, right? In the region around the posterior, but also a bunch of points out here. Um, and whether or not you care about these points depends on the, the question you're trying to ask, since these are very useful if you're trying to compute things like the evidence, um, since that depends, of course, on averaging over the prior, over all parts of the prior, so these are very useful. But if you're primarily interested in using nested sampling as a more robust tool for doing inference, um, you know, for estimating posterior-based quantities, then this isn't super helpful, right? You're kind of wasting some fraction of time sampling way out here, uh, you know, far away from the peak of the, of the bulk of the posterior mass rather than kind of here in the typical set. So what dynamic nested sampling tries to do is it says, if I'm going to add in more and more points, I can use sort of my past experience uh, given my estimate of the posterior and mostly just add them in directly here. So rather than adding in more samples out here where I know that they're not very important, I can instead just add samples directly in sort of this target region of interest. Um, and hopefully uh, that's kind of what I'm more interested in doing. So that's the basic idea behind dynamic nested sampling. There are a bunch of heuristics that, that are used um, in practice to actually make this work. But here's sort of one example of how this allows nested sampling to be both more flexible, um, but also more accurate. On the left, this is showing the distribution of points with the color based on the relative weights um, for a simple 3D Gaussian problem. And these are just showing different 2D projections. Um, and when you can see as in standard nested sampling, what you've done is you have a bunch of points sort of out here. And then as you get sort of close and close to the posterior distribution, you kind of converge to the general structure, you shrink, you have most of the, the weights sort of concentrated in this ring. Again, highlighting the, the actual way that nested sampling highlights and actually uses this posterior mass or this typical set. And that's kind of the basic behavior. If you then use dynamic nested sampling to say, I only care about really, you know, uh, estimating the posterior as accurately as possible. Then once you have an estimate of where that is, there's no reason to add any more samples um, in these far away regions. And so that's what's shown here is that in this particular case, the same number of samples, again, from left to right, have just been allocated differently. And we've instead just put a lot more of them in this region right around sort of where this, this bulk of the posterior mass is. Um, and because of that, kind of the weights have slightly shifted around because we have more samples here. So we've sampled, uh, you know, not uniformly, but overall, like you can see, there's just a much more efficient allocation of points. On the flip side, if we're really interested in estimating this integral, then we don't actually care about having as many points here in the center. We want to have more points near the edge. But you can see in this case is that's what we've done is we actually have more points sort of allocated further out here, um, you know, both uh, in lower and faraway regions of the prior as well as regions of the prior that are sort of halfway between the bulk of the posterior mass um, and the actual uh, prior distribution itself. And again, these all have the exact same number of points in every plot. Um, and so this is just showing that with dynamic distance sampling, there's a lot of flexibility in tuning sort of the way the algorithm works to really target a specific application that you want. So it gives all the benefits of nested sampling in terms of being flexible and robust and being able to characterize lots of these distributions, but with fewer drawbacks, um, at least in terms of how, how the actual sampling behaves. So to close things out, um, I don't think this would kind of be a, a, you know, a talk here, um, but I did talk a little bit about Dynasty. Um, so one of the things that I've been uh, really grateful to have, you know, had a chance to participate in and, and uh, contribute to has been uh, developing an open source, uh, you know, public Python package that was designed to really make dynamic tested sampling um, both easy to use and really accessible to lots of members of the community, but also very easy to customize. Um, and that's kind of shown here in the logo where I actually ran the code itself, Dynasty, to sample a distribution that I made uh, sort of in the shape of the letters. Uh, just highlighting sort of how this works in practice. 
Um, I designed the code to be really modular. Um, so you can mix and match all these different methods and approaches I've described before from dynamic nested sampling, from standard nested sampling, bounding strategies, sampling strategies, various ways to adjust sort of, uh, you know, target functions and stopping criteria. Uh, and, I, and it also includes a bunch of built-in plotting utilities and post-processing tools. And again, just, uh, you know, since Dan is talking right afterwards, uh, I'd be really remiss in saying that, you know, the entire structure of the package and my, you know, attempt to actually create it in the first place was really, really inspired by, by uh, you know, his own package MC, which has really helped to encourage uh, a lot of uptake of, of MCMC methods in the astronomy uh, literature and has been heavily utilized and I think has generated a, a world of good um, in, in trying to make this happen. So hopefully Dynasty is able to do uh, at least a little bit of, of the same on trying to bring nested sampling methods, you know, really into the literature um, and make them sort of more widely available and uh, easy to use. So I wanna sort of step back now and sort of summarize uh, kind of what, what we've covered so far in the talk. Um, I know sometimes these often have bullet points, but I tend to like slide uh, these to have a little bit more pictures. Um, so in sort of the first third of the talk, I really focused on uh, you know, some of the motivation and concepts behind nested sampling and how it really works in practice um, and why I think it's really, really uh, a useful toolkit um, to use for a lot of problems in, in uh, you know, especially in gravitational wave astronomy and model selection um, and parameter estimation, you know, focused on this idea of how we slice up this distribution to these different uh, likelihood levels and then how it turns that, that particular way of slicing the distribution into this really cool way of doing integrals. And that in doing so, it gives us a method that sort of samples in a very natural way by actually giving weights that are proportional to this typical set. That's the product of sort of the density times the volume, giving us sort of the, the actual bulk of the posterior mass um, and sort of how exactly all that, that roughly works. Um, I then discussed a little bit of practical issues related to how this actually gets translated into sampling in practice in particular focusing on you know, some of the stopping criteria, uh, bounding strategies, and also sampling strategies that are used um, in order to do this, all of which have their various benefits and drawbacks. Um, and finally, you know, highlighting a little bit of some of the modifications and, and uh, applications for this, including sort of conceptually, how, how do we want to tune nest sampling behavior to give us something that's a little bit more flexible, um, how that gives rise to sort of dynamic nested sampling, uh, and how we can use that to sort of sample from the same distribution in very different ways using the same sort of baseline approach. And then finally, how this uh, sort of ended up being implemented in this, in this uh, public nested sampling package dynasty. So that's, uh, that's all I have. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to take any and all questions. Thanks. <laughs>